I, I want to refer you to the nativia.org uh, uh, web page or to Facebook, Nativia Facebook, or YouTube. You'll find some fascinating things there called, uh, that I called mind candy. I do two or three a week. And they have things that uh, most Christians don't uh, know. Even the professors and preachers don't know mainly because they don't study deeply enough the Old Testament and, not, and they don't study it in Hebrew and the translation don't often reflect their reality. But this morning I decided to do something very different. The title of what I do, want to do is called For Such a Time as This. It's a quotation from the book of Esther. But I want to start with uh, another Jewish disciple of Jesus called Bob Zimmerman. Bob Dylan for everybody else. He became a believer in the 1980s through a guy that lived in Van, Texas called Keith Green. And when he became a believer, he published three records about the faith. One is, a, the first one was a slow train coming. Anybody heard of that? Slow train coming. The other one was saved. And the third one was... Uh... Now I don't remember. Uh, gotta, th gotta Serve Somebody was the third record. So, but one of his famous songs is... Uh... I'll read part of it, yeah. At least the first stanza I'll read. Come gather round people, wherever you may roam, and admit that the waters around you have grown, and accept it as that soon you'll be drenched to the bone. If your time, if your time to you is worth saving, and you better start swimming, or it will sink like a stone, for the times they are changing. And uh, the times are changing. As I said, I'm, uh, you know, used to travel before the corona six or seven times or eight times a year, uh, and at least twice a year around the world to three or four continents and preach the gospel to Jews and to Gentiles and to uh, all the races in the world. And the coronavirus has accentuated the fact that the times are changing. And in fact, they're changed already. The whole geopolitical scene in the world, not only the spiritual scene, everything, the economies, the industries, the relationship between great nations like United States and China, uh, the Middle East has changed dramatically for the good. It, during the corona, we've made, Israel has made peace treaties with four Arab countries, three of them in the, in the Persian Gulf, and in the next, uh, in, uh, and in the next weeks after Biden visits Israel, we expect to have a, sign a peace treaty with Saudi Arabia. Who would have believed this from a political and, and geopolitical point of view? Nobody could have imagined it, that we would be able to fly to Bahrain, to Abu Dhabi, to the Emirates without a visa. Yeah. The world has changed and is changing very, very rapidly. And I want to ask you, here, Middle Tennessee, North Boulevard Church, have you felt any changes to the good or to the bad in your community at North Boulevard, in Middle Tennessee, spiritually in your own lives? Have anybody felt any change? Raise your hand. Oh, wow. That's good. Change is never easy, but it's always good, 
even if it's something to the bad, it's good because all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. So we may think it's bad, but if it's personal, it could turn out to be a great benefit in the end. So this sister down here with the white hair in the second row that is populated. Yes, you. Yeah. Has it, you raised your hand that something has changed in your life since the corona. What has changed? Nothing. Everything has changed. What is, where are the elders over here? Any elders? Yeah. Okay. What has changed at North Boulevard? Huh? It's grown, and we've seen that even people's personal faith has gotten much richer for those people. Oh, that's very interesting. Personal faith has got much, much more, I heard, interested or grown. That's what you said, right? That's very important. What's more important for, for you as individuals? That the congregation grows or that your personal faith grows? Personal faith. Because the health of every atom is more important than the collective. Always. Because if the health of the, 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 the building blocks, the bricks that make the building is not good, the building is not going to survive. If your bricks are bad, it's not going to survive. And you, the individuals, are the bricks that make the building that is called the church. Not the physical bricks, but the, the, the human bricks are the most important element in, in, in a community that's called the church, community of Christ. Right? So if you say that your faith has grown, and, as it, uh, and, and that's very important, how has it grown? Who raised his hand that th their faith has grown? Okay, you young men, how has your faith grown? Wow. He was baptized recently. His faith has grown. That's wonderful. I, I saw somebody over on this side also that raised his hand that his faith has grown. Anybody here? I don't remember who it was, but I saw people raise their hand. That the, oh, okay, so, yes. Yes, you're shaking your hand there. How has your faith grown, brother? In your head. Yeah, that's great. My faith has grown. That's why I started doing this mind candy, because the things that I've, I, I, re, I reread the Bible. I don't know, not the first time. The first time that I reread the Bible was in 1974, because a guy came to my door at, after midnight, a total stranger. His name was Lagarde F. Smith. And I, I said, who are, who are you? He said, I am Lagarde F. Smith. It was after midnight. He said, yes, I came to talk to you. Now? He said, now? <laughs> Where did you come from? From the airport. He landed in Israel, and he said, uh, I'm losing my faith. I just quit my job as the district attorney of San Francisco of Oakland County, California. And I was raised in the Church of Christ, and I don't understand the Bible. I said, what is your job? He said, the lawyer. He, he said, I said, you're a lawyer and you don't understand the Bible? He said, all right. Because everything that I was taught in the Church of Christ, and then when I read the Bible, I see that it doesn't fit the Bible. The Bible doesn't support what the church that I grew up with teaches. I said, come and sleep first. Let us sleep also. 
And, and the next day, tomorrow morning we'll talk. And uh, the first thing that I told him is forget religion. Forget Church of Christ. Start reading the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Not a pick here and a pick there, a verse here, a chapter there. That for sure doesn't make sense. But if you start reading the Bible and allow the Holy Spirit in the steps and in the stages to lead you all the way to the book of Revelation, you'll start on the stage. Any book is like that. The Bible is a book. You can start reading a little bit from here, from War and Peace, and a little bit from there, from War and Peace. You'll never understand what's going on. The Holy Spirit is consistent and is giving the revelation in stages that we can digest all the way to what's going to happen at the end of the world, from the beginning of the world to the end of the world. So it's a, it's a one story book. So, yes, people don't understand and don't, are not consistent because they don't read the Bible enough. And uh, preachers, uh, your preacher has done a great job. I've heard his sermon a couple of weeks ago, the first time that he spoke here after his illness, and I loved it. I felt a change in the direction, in the, in the intensity of his teaching when he uh, was here the first time after a few weeks that he was gone. Yeah? But the times are changing in every aspect. And there is one verse that, that came to my mind after I heard Bob Dylan sing this song and then read it again. And it comes from the book of Esther. The book of Esther is the last book that was included in the canon of the Bible. Almost didn't get in. The reason it didn't get in because God is not mentioned in the book of Esther. And the morality of all the characters, including Mordechai and Esther and everybody else, not to speak of King Xerxes, uh, the morality of the book of Esther is not up to standard of the rest of the books of the Bible. We have a, a nice Jewish girl, orphan. Her uncle is telling her to lie in order to enter a beauty contest that the king of Persia is carrying to find himself a new wife because he kicked out the old wife. Because he came, her, he asked her to come to the big party that he made for all the politicians of his empire, and to wear only the crown. She said no. So, his minister said, "Ah, you can't tell you, you can't let your wife defy you, and not obey you. Otherwise, all of our wives will start defying us and not obeying us." And so, kick her out. So he kicked her out. So he made this contest. And Mordechai sends Hadassah. That was her Hebrew name, her, uh, her good name, Hadassah. Myrtle in English. Hadassah is a myrtle. So there are people called Myrtle. I, I met people called Myrtle down in South Georgia a long time ago. Uh, so her, her name, Hadassah, was changed to the most pagan name possible, Ishtar, the, the, the chief female goddess of the Persian Empire. Yeah? And she enters the beauty contest, gets in. Do you think that she was eating kosher at the, the, the palace of the king? Yeah? You think that she was uh, doing what Jewish women should be doing according to the law of Moses. No. So the book almost didn't enter in. So Mordechai finds out that there is a plot that the prime minister of Persia, Haman, wants to kill all the Jews in the empire and is willing to pay money, good money, in order to have the right to kill the Jews. Mordechai panics. He wants to talk to 
Esther, who is the beloved queen now of, of the king, but he can't get in, so he sends one of the guards as a messenger, and, he, and the message that the guard gives to Esther is, what do you think? That if we Jews, I'm going to read it to you. And Mordechai told them to answer Esther to the guards, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. Eventually they'll discover you're Jewish and you'll have the same fate like every other Jew in the world. You can't escape. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from, for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And this is really my message for, for the church today, not only the church here, the churches everywhere. The churches, the, the truth, yes, there have been growth. There has been growth. Yes, the corona also whittled down some of that growth. You know, I remember, uh, you know, the, this class was much fuller a couple of years ago when I was here. They had more people here, right? Am I right? Yeah. So, uh, we are a part of a collective. The Church of Christ is not a stand-alone community in the Western Christian scene. And the whole community, if one will suffer, everybody will suffer. If one will gain, everybody will gain. We are a, a, a part of a whole. And the whole is not only buildings that have a shingle called Church of Christ. We've got to get used to this. The enemy doesn't look at the Church of Christ any different than it looks at the Baptists and the Methodists and the Presbyterians and the Pentecostals and the others. The enemy doesn't look at us different. Yeah. I remember in the old building, in North Boulevard, one of the preachers, very, very good preacher, very good man, uh, used to go to the front of the building and shake hands when the people are leaving. But there was a, a man from Jerusalem that his daughter married the Gunselman boy. Anybody remember Gunselmans? Yeah. And she was Arab and Muslim. And, uh, and they got married and they moved to Murfreesboro and the father, who was a very, very wealthy man, educated, had a doctorate from Paris, from the Sorbonne in Paris, and he came to visit in the church and uh, the, the preacher shook his hand and said, oh, we're glad to have you over here visiting our congregation. And what do you think about our congregation? He said, well, it's just like every other church. He said, uh, oh, no, no, we are not like every other church. We don't have a piano. <laughs> Mr. Harb said, yeah, you don't have a piano. But when I look at the architecture, it's like any other Protestant evangelical church. And when I look at the way you're dressed, you dress like every other pastor that I visited before, wearing the same Sansa belt pants. And they, the conversation went on, and in the end, our dear brother, the preacher, was looking for a place to hide under some table. Yeah? Because we need to realize that times are changing, and we need, we must unite against the arrows of the world. We must Concentrate on what binds us together, not on what separates us. Yeah. We don't have instrumental music in Israel. 
in our congregation, and there is not a single Jewish place of worship that has. Not Orthodox, not conservative. The Reform in America may have. I don't know. I've never visited a Reform synagogue. But uh, it's okay. That's not what's going to determine the outcome of the collective, not of the individual congregation, but of the collective. Yeah. And we have to start thinking in terms of who are our real enemies? Who are, are the real enemies of the gospel? Globally, not only locally, not only in America. Globally, because our world has become global. America started that globalization process. And it is now global. I got a new iPad by Apple. If you read the small print at the back of it, engineered by Apple, produced in China. Yeah. And that's true for a lot of the things that we have. We, we have world trade. And, and what Mordechai told Esther is, look, you're not going to escape if every Jew is going to suffer, you're going to suffer with, with every Jew, even though you're in the palace of the king. And if every Jew will prosper, you will prosper too. And who knows if this narrow straits in your life and in the life of the Jewish community in Persia, if you were not put in this location, in this position, in this economic framework, in this political framework, for such a day as this. This is where we are, folks. And the world is waking up. The world is literally waking up with the Chinese sent the, uh, you know, released or whatever you want to say with the, the COVID-19 virus. But they also released at the same time the Zoom. Yeah. And uh, on the one hand, there is the, 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 the virus that is hard is like the, the harvest of, of human beings into the millions now in the world, literally. America is approaching also pretty high number, hundreds of thousands of numbers of dead, right? Am I right? America has hundreds of thousands of dead, from, but other countries have the percentage is much higher from their population. Yeah. But it's, that's not the problem. The problem is that together with the changes that the virus has brought to the world, the spiritual situation in the world has changed too. And, and you, you've got great spiritual crooks like Benny Hinn, yeah, that finally confessed his sins and his lies and his false theology that was designed uh, to pr for, as prosperity doctrine, but prosperity for the preachers, not for the people. Yeah? For these big ministries, preachers with two or three uh, personal jet airplanes on their name, houses in... in Palm Springs and in other places. I can give you their names. I know them personally. Also Benny Hinn. People think he's, he's Jewish because he, he writes in his book that he's Israeli. He's Israeli like Yasser Arafat. Yeah. He's born in Jaffa. I know the exact place where he was born. His family name was not Hinn. Shahin. He's Palestinian Arab. And he supported the PLO and other Palestinian terrorist organizations at the same time that he was praising Israel and, and putting himself as an Israeli. Things are changing, folks. Like Bob Dylan said, and we have to, of course, continue worshiping and singing and praising and 
doing everything wonderful that God has given us the privilege to do. But we've also got to understand that times are changing. And if we don't learn to dance with the wolves in these changing times, we're going to wither away. Churches bigger than North Boulevard have disappeared, like Church on the Rock in Dallas. Yeah? It was the biggest church, evangelical church in the United States. The preacher was uh, one of the most famous, Larry Lee, personal friend of ours. Personal, so personal that, that he decided that he needs to buy me a suit and shoes and shirts and socks so that I'd be tr dressed right in order to make... Uh, he didn't know that I'm dressed right. You know, that m all of my suits were made by a Palestinian Arab living on the Mount of Olives for $170 a suit. I brought the, the cloth from London and the, the tailoring was 170 He paid a l several thousand dollars for a suit that I only wore one time. Because it wasn't fitting right. It was a, a tailor-made suit is something else. It fits you right. You can move, move your hands. You, you know, you don't have to be, you know, stuck in a narrow suit. So yes, Larry Lee lost everything. Lost his church, his family, his children, his wife, everything. Yeah. Things like that can happen and do happen. That's why, folks, we've got to learn. The times are changing. And if we don't learn to swim, we will sink. Yes. How, how long do I have? Till 1030? It's how much? 10 minutes. Ten, 10 minutes more. OK, any questions or comments? Don't be shy. What? Oh, in Israel, everything has changed. First of all, we've the only country that in three years had five elections, general elections. That's, we're special. <laughs> we're special. <laughs> yeah. It's the only country that ministers in the government go to jail, four years in jail, come out of jail, and they return to the same seat from which they did their crimes. The only country in the world, maybe in history. But uh, one of the things that has changed in Israel is that the people, the religious people, have understood that all these divisions, we have 80 different denominations of Hasidic Jews that have nothing to do with each other. Yeah, because they follow this rabbi and they follow other rabbi and the third rabbi and everybody has his rabbi and they have nothing to do with each other. And what distinguishes them is that each one has a different hat. And I'm not joking. Every, each one has a different hat. And, and because you have that hat, and I don't agree with that hat, then you're not, uh, you're not uh, my brother. Yeah. And, and Jews, Jews are as bad as anybody else on this. Yeah. Bob, remember that we went to Ramah, to the tomb of Samuel? Remember what happened there? Yeah, we went there to the tomb of Samuel one Sabbath, and uh, I was explaining to who was with you. Uh, beside that, yeah. So uh, w this Orthodox rabbi comes out of the the Jewish section from under the tomb of Samuel and listens to my explanations. And he says, uh, oh, you ought to come and study with us. I see that you're a good student of the Bible. And I said, how do you know that I don't study? He said, well, you don't have a, a skull cap. 
You're not wearing a, a, a hat, the right hat. I said, test me. He said, what is the portion that we're reading this Sabbath? I told him it's Leviticus chapter 19, the portion you shall be holy as I, the Lord, am holy. He said, oh, I see you know something. I said, yes. Can I ask you a question? What in this week's reading is the most famous, world famous teaching and verse in, in this chapter, chapter 19 of Leviticus. He said, you should be holy because I, the Lord, am holy. I said, that's a very good verse, but it's not the most famous verse. He said, then what is the most famous word? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He said, ah, that's a very important word. I said, but, but who's your neighbor? My neighbor is only one who is exactly like me. I said, what do you mean? Those soldiers that are guarding you over here, Israeli soldiers, are they your neighbor? They're not my neighbors. They're not me. They're not religious. They don't belong to my particular sect. They're not my neighbors. What about other Orthodox Jews? They're not my neighbors. We had a strong argument there in the end. And you know what? In the end, we didn't agree. He just turned around and walked away, which almost brought me to tears because it's so sad. It's so sad when religious people that should know God and should know that there's one God who created the heavens and the earth and is the father of all mankind end up their religion makes them monsters. And there are Christians whose religion has made them monsters. Yeah? Yes. So that's, that's, dear brothers and sisters, I decided not to take some text and analyze it and all these things. David Young is doing a wonderful job with these kind of things. But I decided to talk to you about what I think is, is very, very important. It is the foundational issue. It's not a detail. It is the foundational issue for the survival, not of the churches of Christ or the North Boulevard Church, for the survival of biblical Christianity. It's a foundational issue, dear brothers and sisters. And remember what Mordechai said to Esther. Who knows, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom of God for such a time as this. God bless you all. Thank you.